They were known in history as the first triumvirate. General Pompey, Marcus Crassus, and Julius Caesar for about five years had an agreement between the three of them in the early Roman Empire. The goal was influence in the Roman Senate. The goal was power. The goal was authority. And for a season, the three of them aligned in their goals and they worked together for about five years until their agendas began to conflict. Over time, it became evident that while their interests aligned briefly, their agendas were very different. And it became clear as that triumvirate began to unravel and eventually degenerated into civil war that ultimately saw Julius Caesar crossing the Rubicon, defeating General Pompey and dismantling their triumvirate. They were similar in their aspirations for glory, but they were not like-minded. This morning in Philippians chapter 2, Paul is going to talk about the importance of believers being like-minded. In our text, he is going to explain why we should be like-minded. He's going to give us a picture of what it would look like to be like-minded, and then he's going to conclude with an illustration of one who was like-minded. Now, with your Bible open to Philippians chapter 2, join with me in verse 1. If there is any encouragement in Christ, if any consolation and love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, make my joy complete by thinking the same way, having the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility consider others more important than yourselves. Everyone should look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Adopt this same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who existed in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he became a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. For this reason, God has highly exalted him, gave him a name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus... Every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. When you come to a passage like this, you approach it with a little bit of awe, a little bit of reverence and humility, because we come to the summit, the pinnacle the Mount Everest of Christology in the New Testament, maybe the clearest picture of who Christ is, what Christ has done, why he came, what it cost him, and how he will one day be exalted, the mind of Christ. This passage, one of the most beloved passages in all of Scripture, it's been read, it's been prayed, it's been sung, it's been meditated on for centuries. F.B. F. F. B. Bruce referred to it as the crown jewel of the New Testament. In it, we find a picture of the pre-existent Christ, the incarnated Christ, and the exalted Christ who he was even before his humanity, equal, co-eternal with the Father, how he became human in form, and then God's ultimate and final exaltation of Christ. The passage teaches us why Jesus came. We understand the sacrifice that was necessary for our sin to pay a price for sins that we committed, but for which we could not atone. It teaches us what it cost 
Jesus to become human when the text says he emptied himself and all of the significance, the impact, the force of what that means, he emptied himself. We learn of God's great love for us in Christ and his sacrifice for us on the cross. Finally, Paul explains as he concludes this final section how all humanity will one day respond to him. That day is not this day. But there will come a day, the Bible says, where every knee will bow. Those on heaven, those on earth, those under the earth, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There'll come a day. So Paul is is admonishing first believers in the first part of Philippians chapter 2, and that's many of us here today. If that's you, then the instructions that Paul is going to give in the first four verses of Philippians chapter 2 belong to you. But if you're here today without a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ, then fast forward down to 9, 10, and 11, and those belong to you. Because there is going to come a day. It may not be today. It may not be in your lifetime. I pray to God that it is. But there will come a day by the authority of God's Word when every knee will bow before Christ and every tongue will confess before the Father that Jesus is Lord. It's the high mark of the New Testament. All of that exists in the context of one statement that Paul makes in the text. Let this mind be in you. It's a powerful thought when you think about it. The word mind occurs several times in this passage. We see it a couple of times in verse 2 and then again in verse 5. The mind of Christ and Paul giving us a picture of what he is praying to God for like-mindedness and then giving us an example through Christ of the kind of mind that you and I are to have. There is a certain sense where it is a possibility, let this mind be in you. There's a sense in which it may not be a reality. It may require a change of mind for you. Let this mind be in you. There's a sense where Paul is giving us a command. It's an imperative. Let this mind be in you. In chapter 1, Paul gave us his prayer for the church and then the great purpose statement of his life to live as Christ. Now, building on that, beginning in verse, uh, verse 1 of chapter 2, Paul transitions, and he does it with a question. It's really an if-then kind of statement. In our English, it comes across a little bit differently than it does in the, in the Greek. Now, in our English, when we say the word if, we typically use the word if as something that may or may not be true. If I feel like it, I'll do this. If the weather is good, I'll do this. If, if, my, if my money is enough, I'll do this. That's typically how we use the word if in our English, but that's not how Paul is using that word. When Paul uses the word if, he is describing something that is already certain. If this is true, and it is, much like we would use the word since. Since this is true. So when Paul is setting up these if-then statements, understand what Paul is saying. He is not saying, if these things happen to be true for you, then. What he's saying is, since these things are true for you, then this is what should happen. So now, with that context, look back at verse 1. If then, there is. Now, Paul's going to set aside four things that he is going to describe as certainties of faith. Remember, Paul is saying, these are things that are true for you. Note the Trinitarian force of these first few verses where Paul talks about encouragement in Christ, love from the Father, fellowship from the Spirit. If these things are true for you, and they are true for you, then Paul says there are some things that ought to be taking place in you. If there is encouragement in Christ, that word encouragement 
really means exhortation. It's the word Paul used in Philemon when he was exhorting Philemon to faithfulness. So if there is exhortation in Christ in you, in other words, if God through Christ is exhorting you, if he's challenging you, if he's motivating you, if he is exhorting, encouraging you, if there is encouragement in Christ, and if there is consolation of love. Your translation may say comfort that comes from the love of the Father. If there is love in you that comes from the Father, if God has demonstrated his love to you, so if there is exhortation in Christ, if there is love from the Father, and then if there is fellowship with the Spirit. It's that word koinonia. If there is fellowship among you that comes from the Spirit of Christ. If there is something that is going on in you, in the body, between you as believers, that can only become through something that the Spirit of God is doing in you. If there is fellowship with the Spirit, and if there is affection and mercy, tenderness and compassion, if there is any sensitivity, if there's any emotion, if there's any feeling, if there is any love that you have, if there is exhortation in Christ, love of the Father, fellowship of the Spirit, if those things are true, and they are if you're a believer in Christ, then the rest of the passage relates to you. So all of this in verse 1 is setting up what he wants to see in verse 2. Verse 1, these are things that already exist. Verse 2, these are things that should exist because all of these other things already do. So if these exist, and they do, then Paul says, I want you to make my joy complete. It's that word that we've already seen a number of times in the book of Philippians, and we'll see almost at every section throughout the book, joy. Paul says, I want you to make my joy complete. Paul's not just saying, I want you to make me happy. He's not even just saying, I want you to, through this, give me joy. What he is saying is, I want you to complete my joy. This is something you can do, Paul says, that would satisfy, it would complete my joy. And he begins to describe three attitudes that ought to be resident in every believer. If these things are true, the exhortation from Christ, the consolation from the Father, the fellowship through the Spirit, if these things are true, Paul says, then three things ought to result from that in your life. Number one is unity. Look at verse 2. Make my joy complete by thinking in the same way. Your translation may say like-minded. He's using the Greek word for mind there. Your minds ought to be working together. Your minds ought to be in unity. Your minds ought to be working together as a fellowship, as a body. There ought to be unity in the body of Christ like-minded, what we think, what we believe, our goal, our aspirations. Paul is saying, I'm praying that you as believers will be like-minded. And then he begins to describe what like-mindedness would look like. He describes the same love, the same spirit, and the same agenda. Look at verse 2. Make my love complete by thinking in the same way. How do we do that? By having the same love, by being united in spirit and intent on one purpose. So being united means we love the same things. It means we love alike. It means the things that, that, are, that are similar in us, the way that we love is the same. We have the same kind of love, the same sacrificial commitment that we have for one another. I pray, Paul says, that your unity is expressed in the love that you have for one another. We should love each other with the same kind of love, the same kind of love with which God through the Father, through Christ, has loved us. We should love each other in that same kind of way. Paul says, I'm praying the same love for you. Number two, the same spirit. Here, not referring to the Spirit of God. That's what we see 
or who we see in verse 1. Here, he's talking about something inside of us. That word spirit refers to what comes out of us from the inside, our affections, our emotions, the inner person. I'm praying that what's on the inside of all of you as believers, Paul says, will be united. You'll be together in spirit. You have the same affections. You have the same emotions. You're united in love. You are united in spirit. And you are united in purpose. Make my joy complete by thinking the same way, having the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. That is, we are not all moving in different directions at the same time. That's not united in purpose. But if we're united, it means we're going the same way. We have the same goal. We have the same purpose. We have the same agenda. We are like-minded. Paul says, I'm praying this would make my joy complete if you, believers in Christ, were united. United in affection. United in attitude. United in action. That our mind, our heart, our soul, and our purpose are functioning and working together as believers. Note how verse 2 is described as something that you can attain. Make my joy complete by having the same kind of love. In other words, you can accomplish unity in the body of Christ. The psalmist said in Psalm 133, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity. Paul's praying for those of us who through Christ have been changed. It means we seek unity, we strive for unity. We don't do anything that promotes disunity in the body. We don't tolerate it, we don't discuss it, we don't we don't put up with it. There's nothing that brings disharmony in the body. Paul says if Christ has made a difference in you strive for unity. Secondly, notice Paul says, make my joy complete, not only by being like-minded, but verse 3, do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, consider others as more important than yourselves. Nothing should be done in the church out of selfish ambition. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's not about our agenda. It's not our church. Nothing that should be done in the body of Christ should be out of what's in it for me. Do you remember that moment when the disciples, they, they just left the supper and they were on their way to the garden. They didn't know that. And they're arguing among themselves, which one of us is better? Which one of us is the greatest? They're arguing about where they sit in the kingdom and all of that about selfish ambition. Here's what Paul says. There should be nothing in the body of Christ that is out of a selfish ambition. Paul's praying for humility. That there would be a humble spirit that is resident, that is indicative. This is not a false humility that says the right words, nor is it some kind of poor self-image that concludes, I'm no good. But it's a mindset that thinks about others before we think about ourselves. C.S. Lewis said, humility is not thinking less of yourself, it is thinking of yourself less. Jesus said, Matthew chapter 5, blessed are the humble, for they will inherit the earth. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, consider others as more important than yourselves. Now be careful, Paul's not saying everybody else is more important than you. That's, that's not what Paul's saying. He's saying, I want you to have this mind. I want you to esteem them. I want you to consider them so that you're not only working for your agenda. You're not only working for your interests. You're not only looking for things that satisfy you, make you happy. But in an attitude of humility, we treat others as though they were more important. If Christ has made a difference in you, then walk in humility. And then thirdly, note what Paul says in verse 4. Make my joy complete. 
everyone should look out not for his own interests, but for the interests of others. So Paul says, if Christ has made a difference in you, then you should strive for unity. You should walk in humility. And then thirdly, you should live selflessly. Everyone should look out not for his own interests, but for the interests of others. We look out for others. We care for others. We listen to others. We perhaps pursue their agenda. We do things that make them look good. We're interested in the things that they are interested in. In other words, we recognize the the function of the church and the kingdom of God does not exist only for me, but in a selfless kind of way, we think of others and we look for their agenda, their good, their happiness, their joy. If Christ has made a difference in you, Paul says, then live selflessly. Strive for unity. Walk in humility. Live selflessly. Now, everything after verse 4 reinforces what Paul has just said. You see the connection by the use of the word mind in verse 5, connecting back to what he has already prayed for us as believers in verse 2. I'm praying that you'll be like-minded. And then in verse 5, let me tell you what that looks like. So while this in verses 5 down through verse 11 is in fact the pinnacle of Christology in the New Testament, it is all functioning as an illustration of everything that Paul just said about striving for unity, about walking in humility, about living selflessly. So now, verse 5, Paul says, let me give you an example of what that would look like. So now, I want you to adopt this same attitude, this same mind, as was also in Christ. So all of these three things, unity, humility, and selflessness, are best described in the person and work of Christ. So Paul says, now, this is the mind you ought to have. If it's not your mind, change your mind. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ. We're to think like he thinks. We're to want the things that he wants. We're to strive for the agenda that he is leading. Let this mind be in you. Now, it's easy to rationalize and maybe object here. I'm not like Jesus. I'm not perfect like Jesus is. I'm not co-equal with the Father. I don't have a perfect mind. I don't have uh, omniscience or omnipotence. But, But Paul's not saying be Christ, what he's saying is, in this area, be like him. Let this mind be in you, which was also in him. Now, here's what that looks like. So, verse 6, the Bible tells us, he, Jesus, co-equal with the Father. Don't get confused by some who have bad theology. While the New Testament describes the birth of Jesus... The Bible tells us Jesus existed in eternity past prior to his physical birth. He he, he was not created through Mary. Co-equal, co-eternal with the Father. Now, verse 6, who existed in the form of God. So he is God himself. He is the, the triune God. He is the form of God. So he did not consider it any kind of injustice to declare himself to be God. He who has seen me, Jesus said, has seen the Father. I and the Father are one. It does God no injustice for Jesus to say, I am God. He's the form of God. So it takes nothing away from God for Jesus to make that declaration. But notice what the Bible says here in verse 6. Even though he existed in the form of God, he did not consider his equality with God as something to be exploited. In other words, when Jesus came on earth, he didn't walk around with a God calling card that he slapped down any time he got in a controversy and said, I'm God. He is God always was God, 
always will be God, co-equal in the same form of God, but he did not consider his divinity to be something that is exploited. Instead, note what happens. He emptied himself. Well, that's the only way the emptying of an omnipotent being can occur, is if he empties himself. Because there is no way that any outside force could empty Jesus of anything. So if Jesus was in fact emptied, it is because he emptied himself. And so the Bible says he emptied himself. A a world of significance in that phrase. He emptied himself. The creator taking on the form of his own creation. Being born through the process of birth that he originated. The one who in the form of God took on the form of mankind. He emptied himself. It does not mean that he was no longer God. It means that he took on humanness. He took on humanity. There was never a time when he was not God. But he took on human form, human limitations. So every human limitation that you and I have, Jesus assumed he took it on. And to do that required him to empty himself temporarily of some of the privileges that he shared in eternity past with the Father and the Spirit. He emptied himself by assuming the form. There's that word again. He existed in the form of God, but he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant. Now, the master, the omnipotent, the creator took on the form of a servant. He emptied himself, assumed the form of a servant, taking on the likeness, there's that word that we see all the way back in Genesis where we are created in the image of likeness and likeness of God. He took on the likeness of humanity, became a man. He emptied himself, a proactive work of relinquishing something he already possessed. He took on the form of a servant. He came in the likeness of man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. Remember one of those emphases that Paul has already made? Unity. Jesus already in union with the Father, Father, Son, and Spirit. Humbled himself. How? By taking on human limitations, by taking on a human form. He humbled himself, not only taking on that form, but he humbled himself in obedience to the will of the Father by being obedient to death. His humility was not just that people might think less of him. His humility was not just taking on a physical form. His humility was taking on not just our human limitations, but a path that would lead him to the cross to pay the price for our sin, to atone for something you and I could not pay for. He humbled himself. Though united with the Father, now humble before him, selflessly taking on the sin that you and I committed, obedient to the, com- to the command of the Father, his sacrifice. Now, we understand a little bit of the humility of Christ. He humbled himself in the garden just before the crucifixion. Hear Jesus saying again, not my will, but yours. He let his own creation spit on him, whip him, and kill him. And that's why the Bible says God has highly exalted him. The one who co-eternal, co-equal with the Father, the one who left the privileges of heaven, the one who emptied himself, taking on the form of humanity, That's why the Bible says 
God has highly exalted him. The one who paid the price for your sin and mine on the cross, the one who rose again from the grave, conquering death forever. That's why the Bible says God has highly exalted him. And the Bible says that every knee will bow. Fulfilling the promise of Isaiah 46, 23, there'll come a day when every knee will bow before him. For some, it will be too late. But there will come a day when everyone bows before him. There'll come a day when every tongue will confess Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There'll come a day where every tongue who has denied him There'll come a day where every tongue that has rebuked him, there'll come a day where every tongue that has misused his name will declare to the glory of the Father, Jesus Christ is Lord. That day's coming. For this reason, God highly exalted him gave him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow in heaven and on earth, under the earth, every tongue will confess Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's the kind of mind you're to have, Paul says. Let this mind be in you. See, the whole point of this entire passage is to point out the kind of mind that you and I ought to have. Let this mind be in you. That same mind that you see perfectly exemplified in Christ, that unity with the Father, that humility before him, that selflessness that Paul describes and Jesus exemplified, let that mind be in you. You see, if you and I had that mind, we'd be united. If we had that mind, we'd be humble. If we had that mind, we would live selflessly. So my challenge for you and for me this week, strive for unity. It's easy to be divisive. It's easy to be cantankerous. It's easy to find things to object. Strive for unity. What can I do in the body of Christ to promote unity? What can I do this week to unite people, perhaps with Christ, perhaps with the body? Strive for unity. Walk in humility. Modeled and exemplified by Christ who humbled himself. How can I be humble this week? How can I be humble in my attitude? How can I be humble before my family? How can I be humble before my community? How can I humble my emptying myself? Walk in humility. Live selflessly. How can I this week exemplify the fact that I realize not everything is about me? How can I yield some things that might be a preference for me? How can I give up something about me to consider someone else as more important, demonstrated by Christ on the cross? When Julius Caesar crossed the Rubicon River on the way to defeat General Pompey in civil war, for him it was a literal river. Since that time, the phrase crossing the Rubicon means a point of no return. It means there comes a point, if I take one more step from here, there is no turning back. I've crossed the Rubicon. I've made a decision. I've decided from this point forward, all of my life, all of my focus, all of my energy is going this way. And my challenge for you this week is to take that step and follow Christ. Cross the Rubicon. Some of you are standing right there on the edge. You've not taken that step. There may be some here today, you've put it off. Maybe some online. You've gotten right close to the edge, but never really made the decision to follow Christ. I'm going to challenge you this morning. Let this mind be in you. 
Some of you have followed Christ, but you've somehow assumed your own agenda. You've allowed your agenda to conflict with the agenda that God has for you. And maybe for you, taking that step of obedience is to turn away from your mind, from your plans, from your agenda, to cross that Rubicon and say, from this point forward, my life is in Christ. I'm following him. I'm pursuing his plans, his agenda. I've relinquished my plans, and I've submitted them over to him. Maybe that's the decision God has for you. In just a minute, we're going to have an invitation an opportunity for you to respond. And maybe this morning God is speaking to you, making that step, making that decision to allow his mind to be yours. Mm 